Welcome to the Association of Certified Sanctions Specialists video message, uh, top five sanctions developments that everybody should know about for March 2021. My name is Saskia Riedbroek and I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Certified Sanctions Specialists. And we will cover five notable things that happened last month. So let the countdown begin. We'll start with an enforcement action. On February 18, 2021, uh, OFAC announced a half million dollar settlement with a Bitcoin company called BitPay Inc. Uh, it's an Atlanta based company and they are a payment processor and they enable merchants around the world uh, to accept cryptocurrencies from their customers. And according to OFAC, they provided cryptocurrency services in sanctioned regions. So what went wrong? Uh, BitPay, this company, did have a sanctions compliance program, uh, but it only focused on screening uh, their direct customers against the sanctions list. They did not screen the, uh, the customers of these merchants. So um, according to OFAC, this company actually had information, uh, physical, uh, inf physical addresses and IP addresses, that showed that these buyers, these customers of these merchants were located in sanctioned countries, including uh, Syria, North Korea, and Iran. I think this case sends a strong message that companies should not just screen the merchants, but also have a minimum understanding about the uh, identification and location information that is available to them about the customers of these merchants. So it's actually going into the dangerous compliance area of knowing your customers, customers, KYCC. This is actually the second case, uh, OFAC case against a cryptocurrency company in less than two months. Uh, the first one was in December against a company called BitGo. So, and because this is already the second one in such a short time, I really think it's a strong reminder of the fact that sanctions compliance programs are as important as anti-money laundering programs. On number four, and we're staying in the cryptocurrency land, uh, we have an indictment from the Department of Justice uh, in Los Angeles against North Korean military hackers. They were engaged in a wide-ranging wide -ranging scheme involving um, hacking, cyber attacks, uh, financial crimes uh, with crypto assets around the globe. And the indictment was actually expanding on an older case uh, involving a cyber attack against Sony Pictures. Maybe you remember that case. In this case, the new indictment involves counts such as uh, malicious applications, um, cryptocurrency heists, and things like ATM cash out schemes. But there's also an interesting sanctions angle, and that's the focus of my number four here. So the count number two in the indictment is about a scheme using cryptocurrency vessels and sanctions evasion. Uh, so let's hear from Tracy Wilkinson, uh, the acting US attorney um, in Los Angeles. In 2017 and 18, the North Koreans developed a digital token called Marine Chain, which would trick investors into purchasing ownership interests in marine shipping vessels, such as cargo ships, not knowing that they would be, be providing cash to an outlaw regime. The Marine Chain token, supported by a blockchain, not only would have given the North Koreans controlling interest in shipping vessels, it would have allowed them to obtain funds from abroad and skirt U.S. sanctions that were placed on the regime. So this is interesting, not. I looked at the indictment and I saw that the defendants uh, created a so-called digital token that represented like parts of ownership of maritime vessels. And they sold that, they marketed that to individuals in Singapore. So this would actually allow these vessel owners to sell parts of ships, cargo ships, to individuals and institutions who can then trade them with other buyers. And the people behind this scheme did, of course, not disclose that they were North Korean citizens. They used fake names. Um, 
and uh, this is this is really a, a you know you have to read the indictment. <laughs> so we're talking about a cyber scam uh, behind some blockchain powered maritime investment marketplace that is used by North Korea to evade sanctions. This issue actually came up in a 2018 or 19 19 uh, panel of expert reports from the United Nations. So. Um, it is something that you definitely uh, should read more about if you're into this uh, the sanction space. And by the way, I googled them, I checked out the website, but the website of this, this company, Marine Chain Token, is no longer in the air. Uh, I also checked the OFAC and the UN sanctions list, uh, but they're not designated either. On number three, on February 11th, the U.S. government launched a new sanctions regime in response to the Burmese or Myanmar military coup. The U.S. Treasury designated a bunch of individuals and entities connected to the military apparatus responsible for the coup. The recent action uh, actually shows that sanctions come and go. Uh, in 2016, under President Obama, the U.S. ended its sanctions program against Myanmar or Burma. Um, so this meant that the economic and financial sanctions uh, were no longer in effect. So all the individuals and entities blocked under these Burmese uh, sanctions regula regulations at the time, they were removed from the OFAC SDN list. Uh, later in 2019, and here you see they come and they go, uh, Myanmar military leaders, including General Min Aung Hlaing, <laughs> where I have a hard time pronouncing his name, were added again to the uh, OFAC SDN list. And this time not under the, under the Burma regime, because it no longer existed, but under the Magnitsky Human Rights Violation Sanctions Program. Um, well, actually, considering the fact that this guy, this general, is actually the leader of the junta who seized power this month, he doesn't seem to be too concerned about international pressure, even um, under financial sanctions. On number two, uh, we have a Moscow visit of uh, the EU High Commissioner, uh, Joseph Borrell. Uh, he's actually the eyes and the ears, sort of like the foreign minister uh, of the European Union. And he is the, the top diplomat dealing with sanctions. His recent visit to Russia, he discussed, in this visit, he discussed Mr. Navalny's case uh, and Russia's behavior in Europe. Uh, but it received a fair amount of criticism, to say the least, uh, from different directions. According to the US, the EU uh, spokesperson, the reason for, for the trip was to deliver a firm, uh, unequivocal, and clear message from the EU about the case of this. Um, uh, a, a political opposition leader, Mr. Navalny, and about the state of the EU relations, relations, um, the Russia's role and behavior in Europe. So um, here's what the EU spokesman says about the trip. It was no secret and the high representative was very clear ahead of the trip to Moscow why he goes there and what he wants to achieve. And the main objective was to deliver firm, unequivocal, clear messages from the EU about the case of Mr. Navalny and about the state of our relations, about Russia's role and behavior in Europe. This was done. This was deliber delivered very clearly and very firmly uh, to the Russian counterpart. Well, in fact, the visit played out a little bit different. Uh, according to press reports, uh, overall, it was a disastrous uh, performance by Borrell, who acknowledged that the EU has not taken any step towards imposing new sanctions on Russia over the Navalny case, not yet at least. And the Russian foreign minister also slammed the EU as unreliable. Uh, Mr. Burrell reportedly stood by silently and semi-smiling. Um, and in addition, he learned later via Twitter, uh, during his visit still, that Russia had expelled uh, several dip EU diplomats uh, for attending a demonstration in support of Navalny. And here we have number one. On February 1st, uh, both Congress and the Senate sent letters to the Department of Treasury. 
they expressed their deep concern about something that the Trump administration did a few days before he left office. It was a decision to lift sanctions and issue a license to Mr. Dan Girdler, a Israeli billionaire linked to corruption in Congo. Uh, Mr. Girdler was uh, designated by the US uh, several years ago in 2017 under the Global Magnitsky Sanctions Program. And supposedly he became rich because of hundreds of millions of dollars worth of corrupt mining and oil deals in Congo. So here on the screen, you see the license. Uh, it was quietly issued in January. And I mean, this is really a specific license just for this, this person and his companies. And I was shocked when I saw it. It's really a blow to anti-corruption efforts. And I haven't seen anything like it before. On February 19, uh, members of the International, International Civil Society organization, uh, several organizations published an open letter to financial institutions about this license. And in this license, they urge financial institutions not to unblock um, his accounts and not to allow activities under the license until the Biden administration has had a chance to review the reason for issuing this strange license. According to the New York Times, who wrote a very interesting article about it, the Biden administration is now investigating why the license was issued and if it can be revoked. I certainly hope so. Well, this was it for this month. Uh, please visit sanctionsassociation.org for more information about training our upcoming conference on European and global sanctions on March 9 and 10 and our certification program issued by the Association of Certified Sanctions Specialists. See you next month. Thank you.